Constructing your life is about much more than just building a bank account. Each week, join real estate entrepreneur and mindset coach Austin Linney as he interviews guests who are constructing their dream lives and impacting the world around them on a daily basis. If you're an entrepreneur or wanting to start a business, or you just want to hear motivating stories of how others have overcome the odds, you are in the right place. And now for your host, Austin Linney. Guys, welcome back to Construct Your Life. This is Austin Linney here. I have the honor of having Adrian in the house. How are you doing, sir? Wonderful. How are you? I'm doing good, man. Sound looks like you got quite an amazing piece of property back there. Yes. Uh, in this market, if anybody that's on podcast can't see it, he, it's probably worth like a, a cool million, right? <laughs> well, it's I call this one my bank account. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so on uh, the podcast, what I like to do is I like to let guests kind of start their story where they are, and then we'll kind of go from there. So feel free to start wherever you want. Okay. So I got into real estate investing about 18 and a half years ago because I was being evicted from the house I was living in. My mm-hmm. friends and I were terrible tenants. And I had a family member that he was a mortgage broker and he said, Hey, why don't you buy something? And if People that were in the game back then remember that you didn't have to have anything to buy a house back then. Uh, I actually finally looked it up. I purchased that home with only $1,500 out of my bank account. I wrapped up all those closing costs, everything, and moved all my friends in to help me get evicted. And I was definitely a big part of that reason, but it worked out way better than it uh, should have on paper. Everyone uh, paid for my mortgage and I lived for free. And I was like, this is a pretty cool thing. Mm -hmm. So my second house ended up being a short sale. It was not so cool. I bought at the top of the market. I had an arm. I was losing a little bit every month, but it's okay. You'll refinance. You know, I bought into that whole thing. And in hindsight, that ended up being one of the best things I've done because it made me a very conservative investor. Mm -hmm. So it slowed me down a little bit uh, using the bank financing, uh, but we'll fast forward uh, about six years ago. I really got into the investing world, not as a hobby. I didn't think I was a hobby back then, but knowing what I know now I was. And then I slowly got into mobile homes. Really, I just listened to the old wise guys and girls in the back of the meeting room that they've been doing this longer than I've been alive. And you know, they all mentioned mobile homes at some point, you know, they either owned them right then or used to. So as of a week and a half ago, we actually sold our last ranch site built home, which was that very first house I ever bought. Okay. And now we're strictly mobile homes with the land. We've done a little bit of wholesaling. We've done a little bit of lending. We've done a little bit of mobile homes in the parks but our primary business is the buying the mobile homes with the land, printing them out. Um, we are going to lend on a little bit of self storage right now at, from that money we just made from that first sale or the first property I ever bought. Mm-hmm. And but we, we've gotten really good at staying at one niche. And I say we, because as you can see, it's my shirt. Uh, for those that are actually watching, uh, it's my wife and I, uh, I do most of the business she takes care of some behind the scenes and mm-hmm. things. That's my quick story. No, I love this. This is perfect because we were I was playing golf with some investors on Saturday, some buddies of mine, and we were talking about mobile homes the whole time. So this is a this is a poignant conversation. But I digress to say this first. So uh do you know who Naval Naraki is? Naval? So he's this guy, it doesn't matter. He's an angel investor who owns many companies. I just finished one of his books. And basically what you just said, as far as learning from the old wise guys, he said that these day and age, this society, especially, we're very concentrated with the new, the flashy, the let's do Airbnb, let's do these things, let's do these things. But yet, he said, really, all you need to do is read the foundational books of America, you know, microeconomics and Napoleon Hill, and, and, and you need to read those books over and over again so you understand them. And One of the things that young kids have a tendency to do is they think that the old people don't have anything to say when actually those are the quietest guys and they probably have the most amount of money. Right. So when you started listening to them, right, 
Um, cause everybody's enamored with wholesale and Airbnb and all these things. What, what were they telling you that kind of made you perk up? Well, I call it the, the slow, boring money. They talked about, you know, we hear mailbox money, the, mm-hmm. the same thing where they're really in the game still because they enjoy the real estate investing. They don't mm-hmm. have to do it anymore. And they were just saying to be simple, uh, niche down to one thing. And that was difficult for me because when we were transitioning to mobile homes, I was like, no, I still want houses to wholesale. But I, I listened. It was hard. And I listened and we still get houses here and there to wholesale. Mm-hmm. And more I've niched down and done just this one thing. Another huge piece, which I'm very glad I listened to, is to stay in my tight radius. For me, it's 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. So it's 30 minutes from our house. And in the growth phase, I would have grown faster uh, buying further out. But now that I'm not in an extreme growth phase, I would probably be hating that because I would have to be driving an hour to a property Mm -hmm. if I need to go check on something. And now it's just that 30 minute little diamond that we have. Mm -hmm. Uh, That was a huge piece for me because I have friends that drive eight hours for properties. (sighs) Yeah. Anyways, uh, keeping a very low overhead, that was another. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We don't have a big team and we don't want a big team. <laughs> Dude, I, just you come with me everywhere we go. And so I can every talk I do uh, and I, I, I talk till I'm blue in the face. I have a I have a coaching client who uh, left his full time job and started wholesaling in March. And as July 2nd has created one hundred and twenty seven thousand dollars. Right. But wait, his overhead is 2100 bucks. And he said, every time I listen to damn podcast or something, they're like, scale up, get a cold caller, get a people get. And he's like, but I don't want that. Like, and I'm like, you don't have to do that. And so it's one of those things that's not talked about enough. I don't think. Well, there's a, a big guru teacher out there. I, I believe he's spoken publicly on us, but I won't mention his name just in case. Uh, I remember this was just last year, or earlier this year. He was bringing in 107, sorry, he, his expenses were 174000 a month. Yep. And once he finally did his books, he realized he was actually losing money every month. And he had like 10 businesses, massive. I and mean, he was speaking over 50 weeks a year. And within a week, I think he cut it all down where he was profitable because he just didn't see it. He was just scaling. And every time a new good idea, you know, he's a big name and now he's, Got a better life, he was saying. He's enjoying what he's doing better, and he's actually making more money. It's it's the it's those tried and true things of staying in your gifts, leveraging out what you're not good at, and then ultimately, because this is the same conversation that we always have. I'm curious if you sit around with your friends, and we say this comment to ourselves all the time: as much as I want all the things, I want none of the things. Like, you know, it's like, yeah, that sounds really great. And if it wasn't for my need to impact others and create jobs, right, which is probably my number one need is create good people, good jobs. I think that my my life would look really different. Like maybe I just coached and did the podcast and that's all I did in one day. And then I wasn't, you know, and so it's really hard to get across to, to investors, especially when they're getting started. And I think one of the things that's very interesting there is I think too many people invest to hit a home run. Like they're trying to, they're trying to invest or hit that one property to get them out of a spot instead of just investing because it's a good deal. That, so that was my biggest takeaway a few years ago. I was on a cruise, an investor cruise, and it was kind of a reunion for uh, Jack Miller. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the name. He was a older creative investor that he taught most of the big speakers out there now anyway so a lot of his students were on there 30 40 of them and they were probably up all been doing real estate for 40 50 years so i went around trying to talk to all of them and that was probably the, my biggest takeaway mm-hmm. is to get just a good deal and you'll do better by getting a good deal today not one that loses money and not one that breaks even but a good deal than waiting two or three years to get a fantastic deal. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, you already know it. The, the momentum you get from the smaller deals, the appreciation, if you're looking for that, you know, obviously we don't because of what I have behind me here. 
but the cash flow, the depreciation, all the different pieces that come with it in the few years, it builds up and it's way better than getting a few home runs. Yeah. And, and, and moreover, if you look at Warren Buffett's career, like he hasn't had that many home runs. Right. Nope. And it's like and what we're trying to do on a different scale from the construction development business side is we're trying to add in businesses that supply the main business. So okay. then we then we catch money a couple of different times. Right. We're feeding our own machine. Right. And so there's many different ways to go about it. But what was it about uh, the mobile home business as you started getting into it more uh, that started it started resonating with you more and more? And what were the factors that played into there? I mean, really, my coach is the one that took numerous time for him to get me to answer the question correctly, from my correctly, is what I really wanted was cash flow. Because mm-hmm. at the beginning, I was investing for everything, for cash flow, for appreciation, appreciate, I was doing everything, which is a great way, but it wasn't at the speed I was really wanting. And he helped me discover for myself that I was wanting cash flow today. Mm-hmm. And that's how we created the lifestyle we have. And one of my big bragging points is I allowed my wife to be able to retire at the age of 29. Mm. Uh, that doesn't mean she sits around and does nothing. She's able to work where she wants, when she wants, because now she's a travel RN and she's loving that. Mm-hmm. And she wouldn't have been able to take that leap if she didn't have the freedom. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. we, we invest for cash flow. You know, do we get equity and appreciation and, these older mobile homes, which is our real niche, yes, I never count on it. All I look at is cash flow. And mobile homes have bigger cash flow because they're higher risk. Most investors are scared of them. You know, there's all, a lot of different reasons they're not as financeable. I look at cash flow. I put that's it. What what before you got into the sector, if you were to talk to your older, your younger self, excuse me. And what are the things that you realize about that business, the mobile home business that you didn't think or you had like a obscured view on it from looking from the outside? I was ignorant on mobile homes. I thought that they were trashy. They were dangerous. Uh, hurricane missiles, you know, everything negative about them. And now I know that it's not so much the mobile home. It's where the mobile home might be. Mm-hmm. There's site built houses. There's apartments. There's everything in bad areas and then there's some mobile homes in good areas so it's not that stereotype isn't that true it's the home it's where you buying not so much the product itself so and then the rest of it of that they fall apart how can you even rehab something like this which we did it was ignorance Mm -hmm. i didn't know anything about mobile homes once i learned about them I, i can fix pretty much anything well not me i can hire someone to fix pretty much anything exactly Uh, can you, anybody that's listening, can you kind of walk us through just a basic, like, let's say that you own the land, how do you go about making your money and so on and such? The home and land together, that's like our main business. We like to buy them really at 20% is the lowest all in ROI that we'll buy at. An old one, this is a 1960s, it needs a lot of work. That's a higher risk. So we're looking for 30% because we have the higher risk and we have the hurricane. But we buy it and our niche is we want a blue collar worker handyman to move in there. So we're fixing it up to attract that person. We know that our ideal tenant, they want, they value the quarter acre lot a lot. They don't need granite countertops. They don't need it painted because they'll come in and paint it and do the work. Uh, We make the home safe, livable, and honestly, a little ugly. Uh, Even my plumber the other day, uh, he was telling another investor, he's like, Miss Liz, do you know the condition Adrian puts some of his properties in when he goes to rent them? She's like, Yes, yes, that's the niche he has. But what that does for us is you disqualify yourself if you don't want to come in and paint or you Mm -hmm. don't want to come in and spruce it up. And that's just the niche of the person we want. We want someone to come in, do some work. I'm not talking about a hole in the roof, broken windows, you know, electrical exposed that they're going to do it. And then that means it's their home. 
they mm-hmm. they want to stay there longer is my philosophy. And, and we get along great. You know, we've had even a tenant, I deliver a holiday gift every year and he's like, Oh yeah, by the way, a few months ago, uh, I replumbed the whole bathroom. Uh, the plumbing was all wrong. He's a plumber and he never called and told me or anything. That's great. That's what I want. I want someone that that's their next. They're going to take care of it. Now, if he has an electrical problem, I want him to call me and he knows mm-hmm. that. So that, that's the way that we do it. I know everyone's not comfortable with that. If that's not it, you have to fix it maybe a little nicer and then you just rent them out. You know, we look for very, very long-term tenants. Mm-hmm. That is probably our biggest niche is we want someone to move in and stay there forever. And then when they pass away, we want their kids to move in. And when they pass away, we want like that's I tell our tenants that mm-hmm. long-term tenants is the biggest way we make money. Yeah, there's a psychology behind that. Is there's there's an there's an act of ownership. There's an act of taking responsibility for your space. And and that's kind of what you want. One of the things, and this is what we talked about this last Saturday that makes me concerned is, is I'm, I'm living outside of Austin, moving next week to, to North, to Tahoe. But, 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 but as you look at Austin, you look at Dallas and you look at uh, Arizona and you look at, you know, Denver and you look at these markets, right? My concern, especially because I spent 20 years in hot hotels and hospitality is as these rents rise and as these properties rise, where are all the workers going to live? Where where are all the people that work at the coffee shops, the people that wait tables, the people that work, you know, the the, the sheet rockers, the plumbers? And so as that becomes more of a problem, I think this is more of an option, even more so moving forward over the next 20, 30 years. Couldn't you agree? Yeah, totally. And I, that's why I try to push a lot of that. I'm in the recession proof affordable housing space and it's because I like to help those people, but also at the next recession, my space is going to have even more and more people as the rents people have to either drop them or two household income. They have to move down because one of them lost their job. I'm going to be in more demand. Uh, You know, hopefully we don't lose any of our tenants, but if we did, we'd have a bigger tenant pool to pull from to get Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a good long term tenant. Mm -hmm. That's our our goal. And and yeah, it's, I mean, in our area, we have a lot of warehousing space and there's not a lot of housing in that price range that they Mm -hmm. can afford. And it, it sucks. It's something I do get concerned about, but I also realize I can't stress over it Mm -hmm. because as we were speaking about earlier, I stay in my lane. I'm not somebody that's going to go and produce 50, 100, 200 homes. So I'm not going to make a huge impact on that. I just do what I can do and keeping my life happy still. How do you go about sourcing uh, the deals that you found? Well, uh, our biggest way that we've gotten them is realtors and other investors because they both think mobile homes suck. And so I wear this shirt everywhere I go. I've been known for it. it attracts attention. So I'm at a RIA meeting and people say that I, I jokingly tell them, you're right. You're right. Send me all your leads, but I'll tell anyone our entire business. Cause I also know most people still don't believe it. They still have too big of an ego, but we get most of them for, from other investors, realtors, same idea. They're doing the same amount of paperwork and work on a 20, 30, $40,000 mobile as they're going to do on 150. $200,000, $300,000 house. So it, mm-hmm. it makes sense there. You know, we always keep anyone in the deal. You know, we try to keep realtors in the deal because they should be paid. You know, if they're going to bring a deal. Mm-hmm. So that's our biggest way. Everything else, you replace the word house with mobile home. So mm-hmm. Google AdWords, signs on the side of the road, uh, print marketing, door knocking. There's really no difference. And I guess I don't know this fact. Can you go in and buy like separate homes that another mobile home owner owns and then you could own the home or no, that you could do a different way. You have your own parks. All right. So yeah, let, let's go through real quick for the, everyone. The, what I call the three different types of ways to invest in mobile homes. You have just the home and that's all you own is the trailer. You pay someone else lot rent every single month to park it there. 
Then you can do what we do. We own the dirt in the home and it's just a single unit, one home and just one little parcel. Or you can own the entire park. And within this entire park space, you have two different ways you can do it. You can own all the homes, all the dirt, everything. You have a flat apartment complex, or you can own just the dirt and you own a big parking lot. Mm -hmm. So you have all of those different ways. Uh, I think what you're talking about is more if you own just the home and you're paying someone else for the land space, the lot rent. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, you call the park manager and ask, do you allow rentals? And you'll know within about 10 seconds. Yes or no? Um, I know people that try to get around it. I don't try to get around anything. I want to get along with the park manager because the park manager is either going to make your life awesome or make your life terrible. And those are great ways for people to start. Um, I mean, you can get into those for a few thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, when I say a few thousand, I mean, we bought them at 2,300 up to $5,000. Mm -hmm. Now that was about three years ago. So, but there's still not, I mean, I've still had prices about like that come to be. We aren't doing those today because the parks that we decided to deal with were more time management and We've just kind of upgraded our properties, not so much on the income, but on the amount of time it takes to manage it. So I'm kind of starting to buy my time back by getting rid of the more time intensive, but they're a fantastic ROI. I'm talking 75% plus is what you should be getting on those. And so they're a great way to start, a great way to build a relationship with the park owner to maybe buy the whole park one day. See, you hit it. You hit it. I was waiting for you to say it because, because that, I think that's a great way to get your way in. What if you did some repairs for him and didn't tell him, right? And you started becoming his friend and, you know. And I know someone that bought his park that way. And I, mm -hmm. that is in my plans to maybe do the research, find out which parks I want to own, what areas, you know, to make sure they're mom and pop parks. We just haven't gone that route yet. It's on the list. You know, you can only sure. work on some things at once. Yeah. And as you continue to buy more and grow more, what's kind of in the future as you see it? Like, what are you, what are you focused on? So we did a huge shift this year, which is something I never thought I would do. Uh, we hired our office manager full-time salary. Okay. And I, I'm a little different. You know, I never wanted to produce jobs. But she's she's great. We actually hired her from the beginning just to answer the phone because I got tired of all the junk calls. And honestly, she's not great at answering the phone, but she's really good at a lot of other things. So we mm -hmm. eventually hired someone else to answer the phone. And this year we brought her on full time. She's running pretty much everything and helping us create systems. And so the goal here is that she runs the day to day business. Mm -hmm. I just get fed the leads that people actually want to talk or have a real problem they're willing to talk about or, you know, price that they're willing to sell at that works for us. And then she takes care of most of the rest. I support her and really getting on more podcasts, sharing more speaking. That's similar to you. I love doing that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I'm focusing my time and energy over there. I realized different than you, I didn't want to run a podcast. So I was like, well, I love talk, doing this right here, but I didn't get another the work that you're doing. So I was like, <laughs> I'll, I'll source the work to you and everyone yeah. else that runs a podcast. And See, I'll get on here you and know, have fun. You know what? That is something that's never been talked about on my podcast. You don't always have to do the podcast. You can just go on other people's podcasts. You could go on Facebook Live or Instagram Live. Like, you don't have to, and you could eventually, but that's something very, that's a very good point because you can use somebody others else's real estate, somebody else's crowd to cross connect, you know, cross collaborate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other people's time is what I talk about that a lot because I, and I do it within all parts of our business. Uh, I've partnered with people on deals because I didn't want to do all the research that that deal needed. So I partner with someone, they basically got to come in, do the research because they were good at it. I got half the money, they got half the money. And then I brought in the lunch afterward and said, give me the cliff notes. And it see, that's it what seems I'm doing. To, it seems that's to, what I'm doing right now too on the, sorry to cut you off. On no, the, you're uh, fine. Storage facility. 
I've always liked storage. I want to stay in my niche, in my lane. I've been studying a little bit. I know some people that are doing it very, very well. So I said, hey, I've got some extra money. I'll lend on it. And I just kind of want to follow and learn a little bit. So I'm getting paid to learn now. And I get to say I'm in storage. Uh, mm-hmm. Beginning of next month, I'll be able to say that officially. But I'm, not, I'm using all his time and expertise. Well, it seems to me that, that those, those old gentlemen really hammered home like the niche thing to you. Like it seems like to me and your personality and everything, you're very dialed into what you're really good at it. And like, I don't do anything else outside of like my stuff. And, and no, there's, there's too many people that are trying to do, they're trying to be everything instead of be nothing at all. Exactly. And it's not easy. Don't get me wrong. Uh, my mastermind, one of the guys is getting into car washes and the returns are phenomenal. And like the whole setup, it intrigues me, but I was like, no, no, you got to back up. It's not your niche. You don't understand car washes. Like I wash my car at home. So I, don't, I, I truly don't understand car washes, but yeah, it, it is difficult. You know, the shiny object never, never leaves. I don't think you just have to tame yourself. Yeah. And there'll be a time. And, and like, for me, the storage unit is like a, as a nice foray. And it's like, as like, as I, you know, level up and do bigger deals and, 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 and do bigger businesses, like being around those people and like either paying my way in with value or paying my way in with money or paying my way with, in with time, just being in those rooms or being in those conversations with somebody that's way smarter than me at something is, is way more valuable than what I'm going to get on the deal. It doesn't even matter to me. Yeah. And I, that's, I think that's why I love masterminds so much because in a way I get to experience someone else's deal, you know, from the, the story and experience wise, which I get a lot of value out of that. Not everyone does. Mm-hmm. But I just like to hear how deals work and what you did. And like, that's just exciting to me. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. I couldn't agree more. Like masterminds have done so much for me, business partners, uh, for raising to like, I thought I was doing great. Like when I had like three Airbnbs and then I got in the mastermind, they had like 38 and 113. And I was like, okay, <laughs> all right. Uh, what am I doing? And they're like, well, you need to do this, this, this. And, and like in one day, I like streamlined my whole business and I was like, well, that was worth every dime. Like, like it was that quick, you know? And I was going to say the danger of that, at least for my personality is I hear how big and stuff they're doing. And that's like, yeah. I, I want to start stepping it up and, you know, get back into Grant Cardone. And then after, my wife is going to remind me, no, that's not what, you know, we value traveling a lot. So we travel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you, you know, without a big team, you can't do all that massive stuff mm-hmm. without either a big team or a lot of time. Mm-hmm. And I don't want either one of those. So I just have to say, all right, that's not for me. You know, we're doing good. We're doing what we want. We, mm-hmm. We're living our vision. So I, it's a constant reminder. Yeah, I think me too. I, I would say that travel is probably my number one thing I want to do. So I make sure that everything can be done from a, a, a laptop or a phone. I make sure that um, I surround myself with great people. Um, I don't, I think one of the things I realized, especially in the last year and a half is uh, your, your need to have the credit is going to hold you back from making the money. Like, and so like, you know, like, like I was reading this book called behavioral investor and he was like, the reason that is that you are not making the money you want to make is because that you think you're fucking special. (laughs) And he was like, it. yeah, I loved it. And I heard it and I like stopped walking and I was like, oh, damn. I was like, that's my 20s in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah. Because the mundane, the not sexy, right? And I had a venture capitalist guy tell me this. He said, Austin, the farther you get away from the show, the more money you make. The more well, people don't hear about you. Yeah, well, he was talking about like he, one of his businesses is like this plastic thing that comes on like this part of a car. And he's like, yeah, nobody could spot it out of a lineup. And that thing does like five million a year. And it's like, you know, and it's like those are the things when you start digging into business and you start meeting guys that are like leveling up. You're like they you don't even know who they are. Like, I love the silent assassin a little bit, you know, yeah. it's just crushing it. I, there's a lot of investors around 
may, I mean, Tampa has some of the more, is it creative investing capital, I'll say, just because of some of the big guys. But they used to meet at Denny's before uh, COVID and everything. They haven't gotten back in person, but you'd walk in there and everyone looks poor. I mean, jeans with holes in them. It looks like the poorest group of people. And I don't know how many hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars are controlled in that room. (laughs) And they look like the poorest people. Dude. Yeah, I have a guy that you would really like to meet, but he's a buddy of mine who trades off market apartments, like 80 to 180 million. And he's got the tattoos and he makes fun of all the guys in Marcus and Miller champ all the time. Like he's, he works for like Keller Williams, you know, commercial and just crushes them, you know, like all this stuff. And he said, he said, you know what the funniest thing to me in my life? He said, when you start getting in crazy money, cause he has like clients who are like, multi-billionaires and he's like he's like it's really interesting that the guys wearing uh the dudes wearing suits works for the guys wearing sweatpants <laughs> and he's like he's and he's like guess how guess how much the billionaire cares what you wear nothing do you have the deal like you know and yeah. i think we're worried so much about instagram and we're worried about the show and we're worried about all these things when ultimately and this is the reason why you'll have you know except for Brandon Turner, you'd have a clear, you know, if he wouldn't be talking about it all the time, you'd have a clear path in the mobile yeah. home space. But I do think that if you, which if you study psych, psychology and just the economic cycle, I mean, there's affordable housing is the way to go. That's what we're doing with our construction companies, smaller base houses, uh, smaller prices, because I want my, I want my buyer pool and my rental pool to be as big as possible. I don't want it to be as small as possible because it's feeding my ego. I want it to be as big as pocket possible because it's feeding my wallet. Yep, exactly. And the only, I think some people get confused with that though, thinking it needs to be in a low income or a bad area. Mm -hmm. It gets that stereotype Mm -hmm. again. And I mean, we made a rule that I don't buy anything that to keep Unless I feel safe staying my wife there alone. Yep. yep. And I had to make that rule because I made the mistake. I got a little greedy. It was a bad area. And I learned I got to get rid of this. This is not mm-hmm. our style. But that's it. There's affordable housing, smaller, good price points in good areas. It's mm-hmm. it's ignored. So I have a buddy who has uh, 37 mobile home parks. Um, uh, and they just, they just, they're doing their couple first development deals and I won't give the name. I won't tell, but this is mainly to fire you up if this is down in your future. Uh, but he said that he's buying the home for 80 from champion. He's spent about 30 to five to 40 to move it, get it put in place and everything ready. And then he's selling it for two fifty, and he's renting the land out to them every month too. Wow. Those are really good. Yeah, he said, I've never seen anything like it in my life. And what he what he attributes it to is people working from home, moving, and also neighborhoods and major metropolis is getting too expensive. Yeah. And, you know, the, the lot rent, I'm not sure how much your buddies is going to be. I assume kind of lower at the beginning. Yeah. We've got lot rents here that $800,000 a month. Whoa. And the, and the units in there will sell up to $60,000 a unit. Wow. And, and they're used. You know, and that's what everyone says. And that's what I said. How crazy it is it until I met a lady, the 55 up community. And she said, yeah, but I'm a widow and I don't have anyone else. So now someone takes care of the outside of the home. They, cause they do the yard man. And she's like, but I go to Judy's on Tuesday for margaritas. I go play cards at Sally's on Wednesday. And that's when it hit me. She bought into a community. So it's worth $800 a month. If she, or a thousand dollars a month, if she has friends, if she That's lives a in a really good point, a subdivision full of kids, who's she going to be friends with there? Mm-hmm. You know, you're only going to become friends. She's going to be the grandma there, mm-hmm. and not have people her age. And I'm like, that's worth every penny. Well, it's funny that you say that. I think one of the things that people aren't paying attention to, right? And I'll just use Texas for instance, is everybody's moving to Texas for jobs and stuff, right? And you've got young uh, families. And they're, you know, let's say they're 27 to 40, right? Well, guess what? Grandparents are going to move closer to be near the family, but they don't want to live in the city. So if you had 
parks 15, 30, 20, 40 minutes outside of town, just like you said, old folks, mobile home park or, you know, development, like that's a no brainer. You'd have a waiting list out the back of the door. You know, these are the things that people don't think about. Like I'm not, I'm not trying to be in downtown Austin. I'm trying to think about where are they going to be five, 10 years, 15 years from now and just keep that money rolling over and over. Yeah. Because it's a slow, boring thing. I mean, downtown Austin has got all the, the businesses there and everything, but what happens when they lose them? Mm-hmm. You know, we know that all these cities move around and maybe it's not until 15, 20 years away, but at some point, Austin's not going to be the cool city anymore. No, but the outside of it is always going to need people living there. I, no, hundred yeah. percent. I couldn't. Agree I like more. The, bo- the boring rural markets are my yeah, favorite. I'm, I'm I'm good with boring too. So if people want to find out about your journey, they want to follow it. How would they do that? The easiest way is to go to adriansmood.com. That's a d r i a n s m is in Mary u d is in dog e is in Edward. Dot com, and uh, you can reach out to me there. Uh, there's an email. There's all the information there. But I definitely do better with uh, messages. And if you reach out to me on social media, don't mind just saying you, that you found me through your podcast. So I know you're not just trying to sell me a Bitcoin course or <laughs> some other spam. Forex trading. <laughs> yeah. No, my favorite is when a 20 year old tries to sell me uh, some life coaching. That's my favorite. Yeah. I'm like, didn't you just graduate high school? Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> well, guys, if you got some value from this, make sure you send it out to your friends and go. Don't buy mobile home parks. Send them to Adrian. All right. <laughs> we'll see you next time, guys. Thank you for listening to Construct Your Life with Austin Lenny. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and pay it forward by sharing with a friend. Most importantly, take this opportunity to start constructing your life by taking immediate action on what you learned. For show notes, resources, and more information on -on one-on-one coaching with Austin, visit constructyourlifepodcast.com.